Okay, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 19. I'm going to be doing a, a, a Psalm of Palm Sunday message today. Luke 19. We're going to uh, go work through verses 28 through 44. So I'm going to ask you before we get started this, who do you admire? Think of somebody in your mind right now, who do you admire in life? One of the things that I realize is that, uh, that, that over my life, and you just see this characteristic, is that we are drawn to those we admire. The more we admire them, the more we are drawn to them. To them. And today I want to look at <clears throat> Jesus' triumphal entry. And then my goal is that as we look at this passage, that we admire Jesus more. And as a result of admiring him more, that we will treasure him above all things, and that we will follow him in discipleship and what he's calling us to follow him, or how he's calling us to follow him. And so in Luke 19, verses 28 through 44, Jesus enters Jerusalem as the sovereign and merciful king. And in this passage, we see three ways that Jesus is sovereign. And three ways that display Jesus' mercy. So again, in this passage we see Jesus' sovereignty and Jesus' mercy towards human or humanity. And so again, as, I, as we look at this passage, I hope that we admire Jesus more as we see him as our sovereign and merciful king. And that we treasure him greater. And as a result of that, we follow him in discipleship to what he's calling us to follow him in. And so I want us to see the glory of Jesus in this passage, in his sovereignty, and in his mercy towards his enemies. So let's read Luke 19, verses 28 through 44. And when he had said these things, speaking of Jesus, he went ahead, going to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Beth Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which he no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this. The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, those who were sent, went away and found it just as Jesus had told them. And as they were to untie the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty deeds that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, speaking of Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask that as I, as we look at Luke's account of the triumphant entry. I ask, Lord, that we would see you more clearly as the sovereign king. And that we would see you more clearly as the merciful king. And as a result of that, I ask, Lord, 
that we would admire you more greatly. And that we would treasure you above all else. And Lord, that we would follow you in discipleship in greater ways. So we ask that you come by your spirit through the gift of teaching and preaching that you would do what you do, whether we're here in person or we're here electronically through live streaming and even as people will listen to this video on the web page or other means, avenues, or they read it, we ask, Lord, that you would work by your spirit through and in them so they, they would see you more clearly and they would follow you more dearly. In Jesus' name, amen. And so let's first of all look at Jesus' sovereignty. We see this in, in verses 28 through 40. Jesus' sovereignty. <clears throat> There's a stream of Christianity that believes that Jesus lived only by in, in his humanity and that all of his miracles are done by the power of the Spirit alone. But that's just too simplistic and it diminishes Jesus' glory. The Gospels go to great lengths to show that Jesus was much more than a man. Let me just give you just one account. We have the account in Luke chapter 5 of Peter fishing all night and not catching anything. He comes, comes up empty and Jesus tells him to throw his net over the board again into the water. And Peter at first is resist, resistant, but he reluctantly throws the net over and the net becomes so full of fish that it's busting at the seams and his friends and the other fishermen need to help him bring it in. And Peter's response is significant. It tells us a lot about Jesus. It says when this happened, Peter fell at Jesus' feet. And he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It was after that miracle of the fish, and after his response to Jesus, the way he responded, it was after that that Peter chose to follow Jesus as one of his disciples. And as you read through the Gospels, you see that as Jesus and the other disciples saw more of Jesus' glory, their commitment to Jesus grew all the more also. And so today I want us to get a glimpse of Jesus' glory as the sovereign and merciful King so that we admire Him more, we treasure Him more, and we follow His example in discipleship. So let's look at how his glory is displayed as the sovereign and merciful king. I see Jesus' sovereignty displayed three ways in this passage. First, we see Jesus' sovereignty seen in the way that, his, that he acquired the cult. In the way that he acquired the cult. Jesus sends two of his disciples to find a cult and to bring it to him. And he says that if the owner asks about it, you just tell the owner that the Lord is in need of it. And so they followed his instructions, and everything happens just as Jesus says it would. And what Luke wants us to get from this, what Luke, why he included this story, is that he wants us to see that Jesus is sovereign over the events that lead to his death, and he's not a hapless victim. They don't catch it by surprise, but the, the events that lead to his death and his death is all part of God's plan. His death is not a failure to God's plan or his mission. His death is the fulfillment of his mission as the king. And then I see, second of all, Jesus' sovereignty is seen in the disciples' praise of Jesus. As Jesus is heading to down the Mount of Olives, towards Jerusalem, on the colt, his disciples are throwing their cloaks and their robes in front of him, like red, car red carpet treatment. And that was common, or that you see in the Old Testament, that the 
citizens would throw out their coats before as the king went by them. And so the disciples are welcoming Jesus as their king. And all the while they are praising God for all the mighty works that Jesus did and acknowledging him as God's appointed king. We see their praise, they praise God for his mighty works in verse 37. Jesus' reputation was common knowledge. His teaching and his miracles were unique. He healed the sick. He healed the demonized. He delivered the demonized. He raised the dead. He fed thousands with a little bit of food, with a few pieces of bread and some fish. He called the storms. He walked on water. And he raised the dead. Jesus, in his life and his ministry, displayed sovereign authority over life, over death, and over all creation. So as he entered Jerusalem, they believed that nothing could stop him from taking his throne. And though that were true, they were misguided and they misunderstood the truth of Jesus' kingship. Jesus would take his throne, but it's not wasn't a political or earthly throne at this point. It was the throne at the right hand of God, and he would be seated at that throne victoriously through his death and his resurrection and his exaltation. They did not realize that he would take his throne by dying for human sin. We also see his sovereignty when they hailed him as king. Jesus was the appointed and king and sent by God himself. And what I think is in the disciples' mind is Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, which read... Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nation. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. The passage in Zechariah foretold of Israel's king entering Jerusalem on a donkey to the praise of the people, rejoicing and celebrating that the king is coming into Jerusalem. He would be a righteous king, he would be a triumphant king who is triumphant over all of his enemies so that his, his reign extends to all the earth. Jesus is not just any king, but he is God's king whose kingdom never ends. Jesus is the sovereign king who rules over the universe. And then third, we see Jesus' sovereignty in his claim to make the stones cry out. When the Pharisees demand of Jesus to rebuke his disciples for praising him, Jesus responds that if these disciples were silent, the stones would cry out. Scripture makes it clear that all creation is designed to praise Jesus Christ. So if humans won't praise him, then rocks will. If humans refuse to praise him as sovereign Lord, Jesus will ensure or make sure that the rocks praise him. Jesus is the sovereign king. Jesus is sovereign right now. He is sovereign over your life, over your circumstances, over the circumstances in our country, over the circumstances 
in all the nations of all the world. Jesus is sovereign over the pandemic we face right now. And if he is sovereign, he is worthy of worship. He is worthy of admiration. He is worthy of treasuring. And he is worthy of following. He is the only one that we can follow and have confidence that he can accomplish all things for our good in the midst of it. So do not fear in the, pan in the pandemic. Do not fear the pandemic. Do not fear your life or your health or your finances because God is sovereign and he promises to take care of us. Jesus is to be admired. He's to be treasured and followed because he's the sovereign king who went to his death for us. But Jesus is also to be admired, to be treasured, and to be followed because he is a merciful king. The events that lead up to his death were all planned, all, God, all part of God's sovereign plan, and yet he still weeps over those who reject him. He is sovereign and he is merciful. He is sovereign and he is sorrowful over the situation, the rejection, his rejection by Jerusalem. Two qualities that do not seem to go together, sovereignty and mercy, like lion and lamb, makes Jesus even more admirable, makes him even more treasurable, and should make us even more willing to follow him in discipleship. So Jesus' response to the Pharisees and to Jerusalem rejecting him, bringing calamity and disaster and judgment upon themselves, shows mercy. Three ways in verses 41 through 44. Three ways I see, or three displays of mercy that I see in Jesus' actions. First of all, we see Jesus' tender mercy We see his tender mercy in verses 41 through 42. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over their hardness of heart. He weeps over the coming judgment, the devastation of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But Jesus is and always has been merciful toward those who suffer his ministry was a ministry of suffering. I'm sorry, it was a ministry of mercy towards those who are suffering. My response to those who suffer used to be inaction. My, I, I justified my inaction towards those who suffer because so often they brought their suffering upon themselves. Have you ever justified your inaction towards those who suffer because their suffering was brought upon themselves? I don't think Jesus is ever going to be impressed by us. When he asks us, if he was to ask us, why did you not show mercy toward those who are suffering? You say, you say I never was taken advantage of. I never was taken advantage of by those who brought suffering upon themselves. Jesus doesn't qualify his mercy. Those in Jerusalem didn't deserve his mercy. I remember one time when I was in, we were still living in L.A., and I was at a gas station getting gas, and I had a, a guy come up, uh, had a big story about his problems and his difficulties, and 
He had lost his job and needed money, just needed gas money. He asked if he could just have a couple bucks for gas money, so I gave him gas money. Didn't look like a homeless guy, didn't look like a regular homeless guy, so I gave him money. The next week, I saw him at another gas station, and he comes up and asks for money for a different reason. I was livid. I was livid, and I was righteous. I had a righteous indignation that was unjustified. But I was mad and I was angry, I was frustrated that I had been duped to the week before and this guy was telling me another story and I let him have it. He never, never asked me for money again. God is never impressed by our justifying our inaction. Even if someone's suffering is, comes about by their own their own actions. I remember having a conversation with somebody one time, one of our leadership in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Similar situation. We were talking about having compassion and mercy, and they were pointing out that I was not a very merciful and compassionate person. And I was justifying myself to them and telling them I did not have the gift of mercy and the gift of compassion. And I thought, believe in those gifts. And the argument that my leaders were saying is that if we're to be like Jesus, Jesus was merciful and compassionate, that we are to have mercy and compassion because we follow Jesus and Jesus is our example and we are to be like Jesus. Well, one of the things that I've learned living and particularly pastoring is that your own pain, your own suffering, helps you to be tender towards those who suffer. Because generally, we don't have compassion or we can't identify with other people's suffering that we've never experienced. And Paul says in Corinthians that we suffer so we can identify with other people's suffering. So do you shed tears over someone else's suffering? It's very easy to shed tears over our own suffering, but not so much for the suffering of others. Maybe we don't shed tears for others' suffering because we're so wrapped up in ourselves. That we can't see or get beyond ourselves to identify with others' suffering. Following Jesus in discipleship, he calls us to be merciful towards those who suffer. So let me encourage you to pray that you would feel suffering for others. Pray that you would feel suffering for others. Jesus, I pray that you would help us as a church to be merciful towards those who are suffering, to identify with those who, have, who are suffering and in pain, that we would be tender in our mercy towards them. In Jesus' name. Second of all, we see Jesus' mercy in verse 42. We, we, we see his sacrificial mercy. His entry into Jerusalem is just one of many events that leads to his sacrificial death. Mercy towards the suffering moves us or moves one to be sacrificial. Mercy moved Jesus to sacrifice comfort, to sacrifice safety, to sacrifice security, and to sacrifice his very self to relieve the suffering of others. Mercy moved Jesus to sacrifice his life for our sin. To take our judgment upon himself. To experience the wrath of his Father willingly sacrificing himself. Bearing the brunt of that wrath for our justification. For our benefit. So that we would receive eternal life, be justified, and no longer be condemned. 
following Jesus in discipleship calls us to sacrificial mercy. And this leads us to the final way that we see Jesus' mercy. We see it as a helpful mercy. A helpful mercy. Mercy helps. It moves one to act in a helpful, helpful way. It moves us to remove the suffering of others. Jesus helped us by dying in our place that we might be forgiven and receive eternal life. So here's the question for us all right now. In this time, following Jesus in discipleship means... That we are to be merciful. That we are to be have a tender mercy towards others. That we are to have a sacrificial mercy towards others. That we are to have a helpful mercy towards others. So the question for us right now in this time, in this pandemic, in following Jesus, how does Jesus have us move in mercy towards those who are suffering right now? How will we move in suffering right now? How will you and your friends be merciful right now? How will you and your family be merciful right now? How will you be merciful to those who are suffering right now? To those who are fearful right now? To those who are panicking right now? How will you be merciful to those who cannot get out for health reasons right now? How will you be merciful to those who are financially struggling, who may have lost their job or have their hours cut back, and so are struggling financially right now. How will you be merciful toward, towards those who are lonely right now in the circumstances that we face? I think it is really awesome the way our body has gathered together. And one of the ways that we've gathered together and continue to be a community is through Slack. And if you haven't joined Slack, you need to join Slack. Somebody said that they didn't get the email and uh, we made sure that they got the invite email so that they can become part of Slack. <clears throat> what we just set up, I think was just set up yesterday, was, uh, was a I need help Forum. So if you are in need of help for whatever that is, you can put that need there, or we can make someone's need known there, and the rest of the body can come alongside and meet that need. That's a practical way that we can display mercy towards each other. I know of people that have bought groceries for older individuals in our body because it would not be safe for them to go out. I know those who have given money to others. I saw on Facebook a friend of mine, not here in Homer, but a friend of mine who made money in the market because he shorted the market before the market went because of the virus and he made him I don't know how much money, but he made money and he was giving that money away to those who were in need because of the pandemic. That's awesome that we can use social media, electronics, and other platforms to meet the needs of those who are suffering. So as followers of Jesus, he calls us not to retreat in this pandemic, but to serve and to be agents of healing in a world that is suffering. Mercy is feeling 
the suffering of others. Mercy is being sacrificial for the suffering of others. Mercy is helping to meet the needs of the suffering of others. So as we've looked at Jesus as the sovereign king and the merciful king, my desire, my hope has been, is that we as a church would admire Jesus as the sovereign and, and merciful king. That we would treasure him more because we see him more clearly as the sovereign and merciful king. And that we would follow him in discipleship and be a people who are characterized by mercy. Because following Jesus calls us to be merciful to a world that is suffering. And Jesus calls us to be agents of healing and of wholeness to a world that is suffering right now. So let me encourage you, as we go to worship, as you put on that worship set, whether through Spotify or through YouTube, if you do it through YouTube, you'll see the words on the screen. Worship Jesus as the sovereign and the merciful King. Ask Him to make you more merciful, to make you more tender, to make you more sacrificial, to make you more helpful. To those who are suffering. And let's admire Jesus. Let's treasure him. And let's follow him in discipleship. Let me pray for us as we go into worship. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you that you are the sovereign and merciful king. And Lord, I pray that as we admire you. As we treasure you. Lord, that we would follow you. And as we get glimpses of your glory. Following you, our commitment to following you would strengthen and we would grow and become more like you. And Lord, I ask that you would speak to us today, this week, in ways that we can display mercy towards those who are suffering. Give us a heart like your heart, that we would see suffering as you see suffering. And that we would meet the needs of those who suffer as you met our greatest need in our own suffering from our sin. So that we would have eternal life and life evermore. In Jesus' name, amen.